Oh, it's a little uh, random drone footage there. Not quite as much of the uh, low cloud today as we saw here. This was earlier in January, about a month ago. But uh, we've got clear skies where we're at. And uh, let me switch over to the charts here. High pressure covering the central U.S. and uh, the Super Bowl going on. Um, let me see where we're at in the game. I haven't really... I've been uh, busy with a bunch of other stuff. Let me check that out here. Super Bowl. Let's see. Uh, third third quarter, seven minutes. Okay. So Philadelphia ahead there. And, yeah, you can see there on the uh, chart, it's uh, definitely very cold up there in Minnesota. Conditions well below freezing and well somewhat below freezing but much below normal it looks like we're seeing about zero to one degree below zero there in minneapolis right now so we've got uh, cold fronts coming south cold air advection into the uh, lower mississippi and southern the uh, south central u.s there and let's take a look at the uh, hemispheric chart here actually we'll look at the, the north american plot and there we go. So there's that high that we saw there on that chart. Series of fronts coming southward. Looks like uh, kind of a double shot here. One along the coast and another front a little bit further up in the uh, eastern Great Lakes area there. But beyond that, quite a bit of cold air up in the Hudson Bay, uh, Nunavut, Northwest Territories, and Central Prairies area there. Tail end of the front looks like that's near the front range into the northern Rockies and just north of uh, Vancouver, something like that right there. Looks uh, kind of quiet along the Pacific coast, a Pacific high out in that area covering that region. And we got quite a ways to go offshore to get to the first storm system way out there, almost near the Aleutian Isles. And uh, this is the upper air pattern. You can see that uh, here at 500 millibars, we are definitely dominated by the polar vortex, Hud big old Hudson Bay Low, centered uh, just north of um, Coral Harbor, between there and, uh, I'm trying to remember my geography, I think that's uh, Hall Beach up there. So pretty well centered there, and you can see the uh, northerly flow coming out of the western Canadian Arctic there. So here's one wave right across uh, Minnesota there, kind of associated with the deeper cold air. And looks like another wave coming down right here where you see a little bit of this cyclonic turning in the height field. So in between, you can see a ridge right there. There's a trough. There's a ridge. And if we go ahead of it, there's probably a little bit of a flattened ridge here. And maybe a, a trough out in that region there. So to really analyze this in detail, we can use the uh, vorticity chart. Go ahead and get that queued up here. And uh, let's bring this up to the top there. Yeah, there's the uh, current chart, and uh, looks like one wave. It's actually a little bit past Minnesota there. We may have been looking at a, I think that plot that we saw earlier, that was the 12Z map. So that's a little bit closer to what we saw that with that other chart. But there's that wave right there where we have an absence of coloring right here. That's going to be a ridge. And then you can see the next upstream trough right there in Manitoba. So if we're looking for ridges and troughs in this area here where the field is very flat. We can uh, sometimes look for an absence of uh, coloring, like maybe in here to find a ridge. This isn't really a good example, but if we go a little bit further south, yeah, like right in here, that's definitely a trough moving through the flow right there. And you can see the height pattern showing that cyclonic curvature pretty well there. So the vorticity field can make it hard to make it difficult, not difficult, makes it easy to find troughs and ridges that are kind of hidden in the patterns 
as we see there. For example, there's uh, one trough, western Oklahoma right there. That's kind of a weak trough, and that can be very important on storm days. So that's something we would uh, look at if it was uh, a little bit later <coughs> in the uh, spring here. Okay, there's the uh, Thady field there, potential temperature. And you can see that next shot of cold air stretching from about Buffalo down to Kentucky, in through Memphis, and around, about to Dallas. And that's on the heels of that other shot that is on the east coast and extending into the southern and western Texas area right there. And up in the Minnesota area, very cold air in that region. Okay, so we can uh, check out the progress of the cold air. Maybe I'll use the uh, Texas map for that. We'll use the mesoscale. This is the uh, NAM plots there. And you can see that uh, shot of cold air along Interstate 44 there surging southward during the day. And we've had some pretty uh, significant temperature contrast you can see there around Junction, Texas, 75 up to yeah, lower 70s in the Iran area, Bakersfield, and that contrasts sharply with the 20s up in Wichita there. So that's about a 50 degree temperature difference across only about 300 miles there. Yeah, and so there's the remainder of that cold air coming south that's coming into the uh, Tyler and Waco area towards midnight, and then I'll push on down to Houston and San Antonio by tomorrow morning. And there's the freeze line just south of Dallas. However, there's not much aerial extent to this cold air, so up in the high plains we're already developing downslope flow. So that's going to er erode this cold air pretty quickly. So during the day, you can see how we just kind of wipe out that cold air from west to east. And it looks like uh, Dallas is where it does stay cold, only up to about 42 there during the day, 42 down to the Temple area. But out there in Amarillo, 67 there, almost 70 on the Caprock. So it's kind of strange if you were driving down 287 from 70s and you get to Dallas and you're having to dig out the uh, coat from the back seat. So a little bit of that cold air looks like it'll hang on tomorrow night. And by daybreak, looks like 43 in Dallas. Uh, the air mass is modifying pretty quickly, but it looks like another push of cold air coming south. So we see Oklahoma City go down to 27. However, it looks like the same story already developing uh, some of the the change over to downslope flow there and that cold air will probably start eroding around uh, Wednesday into Thursday. So you know this is a really good tool you can use to kind of keep track of the air masses. That's at uh, College of DuPage there. That's under their model products and all you have to do is go to this uh, bar here and you can animate the uh, graphics really easily. Alright, let's uh, move on to the satellite. And that's how things uh, look this evening there. The uh, green and yellows are back and uh, that kind of traces out the extent of the very cold air Generally, where we have green, that's where temperatures are down to about 10 to 20 Fahrenheit. And when we get into the yellows, that's getting down to about uh, single digits to below zero Fahrenheit. So a lot of uh, cold air there covering the northern U.S. and Canada. Okay, I'm sure a lot of people are watching the uh, Super Bowl tonight and... I've actually got an excuse. We don't have cable or satellite here. We 
pulled the plug back in 2009. And that started when we had to upgrade our card and then I, we called DirecTV and they wanted to drill into the house. They wouldn't let us put the dish up on a, a tree, which was working just fine. And they wanted $150 to install the new dish. And I told them to take a hike. And we haven't had any cable or TV since then. But uh, I thought about, you know, maybe getting a little service leading into the Super Bowl, but didn't quite do that. Uh, Justin Pulliam here saying uh, pleasant evening there. David Holcomb has the Super Bowl off for this. Love Meteorology Lab. Thanks. I appreciate that. I thought, thought about uh, going straight through and programming tonight and letting people have a break for the Super Bowl, but I decided to go ahead and uh, do the, the uh, forecast here. Burl H. is here. Fun with tech. Mr. Manlet, 6 degrees in Rockford under clear skies. Rockford, that's about 100, maybe 75 miles west of Chicago there. We had a conference at DuPage back, I think that was about 2002. That was a lot of fun. And I can't remember who orchestrated that, but I would love to come back up to Chicago and do a conference up there if uh, College of DuPage can put that together. Adam Davis heard there was something happening in a really big bowl. David Moore, sunny sky in the Metroplex gives way to brisk north winds. Mr. Manlet has a surface analysis. Maybe I can grab that real quick. Let me take a quick look here. I guess Mr. Manlet's getting a little more proficient there and posting the links, so very good. And we'll bring that up here. And uh, there it is. So I appreciate that, Mr. Manlet. It looks like a zero Z analysis of the uh, Midwest. And yeah, picked right up on that boundary there. And I was calling uh, earlier from about Buffalo down to Kentucky. And I would probably bring that a little bit further south because I can see that gradient that you drew there. And you definitely want to put the fronts a little bit further south along the uh, leading edge of that. So otherwise, uh, that looks uh, excellent there. So good job. All right. Uh, Lost the uh, satellite loop. Let me get back with that here. In fact, I'll just switch you over to the Pacific. Okay, Sue M. Uh, reporting a bit of snow there in Indiana. Mr. Manlet includes isodrosotherms. Uh, yeah. You, you can also put the uh, boundary on the moist side of the isodrosotherms. Technically, it should be density or temperature, but often the air mass does correspond to uh, dew point and humidity there. David Holcomb says, if anybody has experience with AWIPs, needs help there. Meteorology Lab Facebook group. Uh, Ryan, down there in Florida, is with us. Mr. Manlet's reporting an Amtrak crash. Yeah, it's sad to hear there. Ryan Toomey's is in the office working tonight. We have Alexi here watching the game. And just catching up on the rest of the chat here. Ryan reporting windy and sunny there in Florida. Temperatures in the mid-70s. David Holcomb reporting cold air in San Antonio soon. And Sue M says uh, she doesn't have cable either. Yeah, rabbit ears. I, I should probably check into... Yeah, just over the air. That might work out here. Three, three inches north of Chicago by the lake. And Mr. Manlet said the red line, oh, was on the freezing line. I forgot to put the fronts in. Okay. Yeah, I I guess uh, looks pretty good there otherwise. All right, very good. And, yeah, if you just draw that front end, you should be right on the money there. Okay, so we got another surge of Pineapple Express heading up towards Alaska and the British Columbia coast there. 
and that's what we could see there with the loop so more precipitable water and uh, rain and snow inbound into the western Canadian area and that becomes significant in about a week and I think we're going to be generating some Arctic air in northern British Columbia and that may come down the uh, Rocky Mountains and let me switch over to the model I was looking up briefly at the models a couple minutes ago and there's pretty good agreement up to about uh, 96 hours let me put them all together here I'll show you the weather let's do 72 hours on the 7th okay so there's the GFS 500 millibars 7th to 12Z and then I got the GDPS, which is the Canadian model. Let me set that on the 7th to 12Z. So what we're doing is we're comparing models. And here's a European model. Okay, so we're comparing models about three days out. So European model, big polar vortex over northern Hudson Bay. Bit of a ridge, kind of a Rex block here in the Alaska area little trough coming through Northwest Territories and a pretty good ridge build up on the West Coast right there. So those are the salient features that we look at. We'll switch over to the G GFS here. Similar picture, there's that Rex block, a little bit of a difference. Ridge built up on the West Coast, good. So Hudson Bay low over Northwest. Yeah, okay, this looks pretty close to the European model. And then the GDPS, very, very similar. The differences start emerging as we get into the 9th, 10th, and 11th. Let me get those set up. So we're moving forward about two days here. So there's the GFS, and where the differences come into play is this ridge over Alaska, the way that gets broken down. So here we've got this really thin ridge on the GFS, a little bit of troughing in British Columbia, which is indicative of Arctic air and pretty strong polar vortex over northern Hudson Bay, southern Baffin Island near Iqaluit. Uh, I think. I'm not sure how that's pronounced. Okay. Canadian model showing a little bit fatter of a ridge there, showing that troughing in, in western British Columbia there. Okay, that looks similar. And now we're starting to see some differences here. We don't see that troughing on the European model. In fact, it's more of a Yukon. And this feature here that's similar to the GFS. And let me advance this two more days. Okay, so we're up to the 11th. So now we got a little trough on the GFS off the west coast. Big old polar vortex over Baffin Island. The ridge is almost, well, it looks like it's trying to rebuild over Alaska somewhat. And we've actually got two waves, one over the central U.S. and one on the west coast. European model, okay, now we got some big differences here. So 168 hours out, this is where we lose the coherency in the models there. Strong troughing across the uh, western U.S., indicating polar air coming down. Polar vortex over Hudson Bay. Now let's look at the European model. Okay, much different picture. European model's got a zonal pattern. Maybe a weak uh, wave there. So I think the European model may be the outlier here. And I've been pretty impressed with the uh, GDPS here. So this is kind of what I want to go with. And we'll let this play out for two more days. Here's the 13th at 12Z. And you can see now we got this cutoff low with the GFS in California. Now northern Ca uh, Canada goes kind of zonal there, kind of split flow pattern there. GDPS has got this huge trough. This is kind of a cold outbreak pattern. And then the European model, it's kind of in between there. 
So a lot of differences here emerge around the uh, 10th or 11th. All right, so here's the uh, GDPS forecast, and I've gone with the 850 millibar anomaly, which eliminates some of the effects of cold, shallow air. So I can kind of get an idea of kind of like the depth and uh, intensity of the cold air outbreak. So starting out, there's that cold air across the northern plains. And this uh, grazes Minneapolis there. So definitely cold weather. This is kind of a big blob of cold air coming south. So into tomorrow, that heads into Indiana there. One little chunk in Amarillo. And looks like another shot coming together in the Canadian prairies. And here comes the next surge. Looks like that heads up into Ontario. Maybe another split there in the High Plains. And then it looks like the next uh, bit of cold air comes down around the 10th. And you can kind of see the origin going back. This is in western Canada around the 8th. So this is that cold air mass developing in that region. So where does this uh, difference in the model come from? It kind of comes from how the ridge in Alaska breaks up. And this is a hemispheric chart. And this is the, the ridge here breaking up around the 10th and 11th. And you can see that it's probably like this wave here in Alaska that's doing that. And if we backtrack that all the way back, we end up in Japan. And I think possibly right there in Mongolia and Eastern Russia. Let me see if I have that chart up. Yeah, so this is kind of the upper air data in that area. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to forecast this wave in Mongolia where that's going to be five or six days from now. So it's kind of a wonder when all this works out the way it does. So, yeah, there's definitely a lot of uncertainty down the road, especially when we have this fast flow coming from the Pacific. So let me roll that forward. This is probably the wave behind and you can see that heading down into Mongolia on the 6th. Then in, in Japan around the 8th. And then it comes across the Pacific, develops into a low right there around the 11th. The other wave I was talking about is further along. And then this ends up south of Alaska late in the period. So, yeah, a lot of our weather is coming from Japan, China, and Mongolia. And it's hard to know how things are going to pan out after the 9th and 10th, but like I said, I'm going with a Canadian model for our forecast. So I was going to say let's put it together, but I want to see the European model. Let me see if I can bring that up without things crashing. Okay. All right, we were dropping frames there. Okay, give me just a second. I, I can see we're dropping frames. I'm going to wait till things settle down. Okay, 387 drop frames. That's going to be about, okay, 575. Okay, I'm, I'm waiting for inter our internet to settle down. Okay. Been waiting for the internet to settle down, waiting for it to settle down. Okay, 826 drop frames. We dropped about, good grief. Okay, this is what I'm watching here, waiting for that to settle down.
Okay. I think we're done. Okay, we dropped 1400 frames. That's going to be probably about a minute of video. So sorry about that. I'm going to have to remember not to do that again. All right, welcome back, everybody. Now let's look at the, the Canadian model. Okay, here we go. All right, everything is looking good. Okay, there's our cold air coming south in the central plains. You can see this thermal trough across Minnesota there. So you're getting that cold air there at the Super Bowl this evening. Leading edge of the cold air, about like that. So going into tomorrow, looks like the cold air is going to spread into the Mississippi River Valley there. We have a new wave developing in Nebraska there. So this is our next system coming together. It's a bit of a Alberta clipper, and that could be heading for the uh, Midwest. It's been a very active pattern in that part of the country. And it looks like it does head over the Midwest, but it stays as an upper level system. You can see that crossing Illinois there tomorrow night. Next outbreak is coming south, driven by this 1032 millibar high in the Dakotas. And that heads into Illinois and Indiana there. Looks like a wave coming into Texas. Yeah, this is probably about where it is. Cross Colorado tomorrow night. And that crosses Texas uh, early. Actually, yeah, it looks like Tuesday night there. And then we have our next outbreak coming south. Outbreaks are coming in at quick intervals there. And ahead of that, looks like we get some convective weather developing in the southern U.S. on Wednesday. And now we're getting up to the 8th and 9th, and this is really where we're having to watch the models carefully. This is about when we see polar air developing in British Columbia and Alberta. The uh, GDPS is definitely going for that there. And with the difference in temperature contrast, we've got a bit of a front coming together in that area there. And then it crosses the Rockies around Friday and Saturday, and the cold air comes southward. And this looks like it heads pretty much down the high plains. And this is driven by a strong 1042 millibar high. And it looks like that extends all the way into the uh, Great Basin area, too. So it looks like uh, it's probably going to be cold getting into the 11th and 12th. And then after that is when we have a lot of disagreement with the models. So the Canadian model going for another outbreak coming south, 1040 millibar high. And we can see that comes all the way south into the Great Plains. And that we get to the end of the Canadian model there. Okay, so the GFS going for a more pr progressive pattern there. You can see that uh, we've pretty much got southerly flow there on the GFS around the same time frame. It's got no cold air coming south. Looks like maybe around the uh, 19th we picked that up. So we're just kind of getting into crystal ball territory here. I'll just run through the rest of the charts. Looks like the GFS is bringing in some cold air, but it's kind of differing on the timing there. And then we get up to the 20th, and that's the end of the run. And GFS closes out with a big trough on the west coast there. So, yeah, mid-month is uh, looking a bit interesting, but we just don't have any information at this time as uh, how things are going to pan out there. Okay, well, that's about it. Uh, let me take a look at the chat. I'm sure people saw the stream dropping out earlier. Alexi says, don't forget to hit the like button there. And attack of the Clippers in the Midwest. And Adam Davis says, wish we could pick models for actual weather sometimes. Yeah. Okay, well, I appreciate you all joining us. Uh, thank you for watching, and uh, I'll let you all get back to the Super Bowl. Have a good evening, and we'll see you tomorrow.